enough. Um, today, we are delighted to welcome you to this special double header online event uh, celebrating two innovative new books of short fiction and their authors, uh, who I have the pleasure of introducing to you now. Uh, first up is Mong Jin, who made her literary debut with the critically acclaimed novel Little Gods and has now turned her immense talents to the short fiction form with her new book, which I have right here, Self-Portrait with Ghost. I'll just hold that up for everyone to see the beautiful cover art there. Um, Self-Portrait with Ghost is a collection of 10 thematically linked stories, all written during the era of the Trump administration and the first year of the pandemic, uh, which shift geographically between San Francisco and China and explore crucial questions related to intimacy, isolation, coming of age, and surprising moments of human connection. Crucially, these stories together unpack what it means to live in an age of heightened self-consciousness, seemingly unlimited access to knowledge, and little actual power. Whew, I feel like I have to take a breath after going through all that, and uh, there'll be lots to talk about with that, I'm sure, today. Um, joining Mong Jin today is Kamen Chang, another brilliant writer of novels and short fiction, and a National Book Award 5 Under 35 honoree for her novel Bestiary. Um, and Kamen is joining us to talk about her new book, the compellingly titled Gods of Want, which I have here. Um, Gods of Want uh, is written in a surrealist mode, all of her own, uh, Chang's own, and uh, Chang's stories center the bodies, memories, myths, and relationships of Asian American women. Uh, these electrifying relationships have been likened to Killing Eve and Yellow Jackets, uh, if that gives you any sense of the amazing yet terrifying vibe. Um, Gods of Want will move you with its alchemies of myth and migration, corporeality and ghostliness, queerness and the quotidian, which all sounds amazing. Uh, today, our conversation is hosted graciously by Rachel Kong, who is the author of this book here, this novel, Goodbye Vitamin, which has been described as by the New York Times as a darkly comic novel about turning 30 without growing up. So a real powerhouse here today with us, and uh, I'll turn things over to all three of you in just a moment. But lastly, I want to remind our audience of two things. First, uh, this event includes a question and answer session. So please feel free to make use of that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and don't be shy. Feel free to ask questions or upvote other questions that you see from audience members that you'd like to have answered. And secondly, and perhaps most importantly, I want to encourage you to consider supporting these authors and their books um, and Powell's as well by purchasing their books with us at powells.com. I will go ahead and drop links in the chat once we get started here that will make it easy to do so. Uh, now without further ado, I want to turn things over to Rachel and our special guests today, Mong Jin and Kay Ming Cheng. Thank you so much, Alexa, and thank you to Powell's for hosting all of us. Um, we're going to start off with some readings because I think you all should hear <laughs> from these brilliant authors and um, get a sense of, of their work if, you, if you're not familiar with it already. So we'll start off with Meng. Um, Hi there. Um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Kei Ming. Thank you, Powell's, uh, for hosting us today on the internet. Um, hi, everyone. So um, I'm going to read from the last story in the collection. It's called The Odd Woman. Um, and The Odd Woman follows three odd women <laughs> in a uh, semi-parallel, um, not quite this world world. Um, and this is just briefly from uh, the character named Ursula section. To imagine she had laughed the first time. Oh, how she had laughed, guffawing, slapping her knee. Ursula and Ursula cackling on their backs like a couple of hyenas with the glee of what they'd discovered. A simple problem had started it, a party. Ursula wanted to go and Ursula didn't want to go. Ursula could see herself leaning against the bar, sipping gin from a plastic cup. She would lean into a stranger's life and say, 
Isn't it glamorous? Tell me it's glamorous. And leave the print of her black lipstick on the plastic rim. But Ursula preferred to stay at home in her pajamas and drink a vid about a fake person's glamorous life. Ursula wished not to have to look in the mirror to wonder, am I wearing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? Am I too drunk, too sober, not enough of either to be interesting? Why is it so incredibly loud when I breathe? If only I could cut me out like a psychological surgery, said Ursula. Yes, I'd leave the nag behind, replied Ursula, and save her for when she's useful. Their wishes were granted. Ursula was in bed in her pajamas, hiding under the covers, reciting her little worries and chewing her little nails. Ursula was in bed and Ursula also stood before the bathroom mirror, preening in the white light. Ursula and Ursula giggling with disbelief. Ursula was very comfortable in her bed and could imagine lying curled there forever. Ursula swiped black paint over her lips, already starting to feel beautiful, to feel like a dark, sweet beckoning, to be devoured in one untarnished bite. The second time, heartbreak was the cause. You want, said the one who'd sipped from the black-rimmed cup, something I'm unable to give. Ursula denied wanting but was unconvincing. Ursula wanted everything. Most of all, she wanted to kill her loneliness, which was worse when you remembered being warmly held. To divide herself was a necessity. Broken Ursula, weeping endlessly, drowning in self-pity. She was a tumor. Excise her, said the Ursula who wanted to party, and she did. It became useful again and again to leave a version of herself behind. She, they, didn't really understand it but they were comforted, thrilled, intrigued by the, by the ability to present one consistent face to the world while, questioning, while the questioning and bickering others remained hidden, each one a secret weapon in her arsenal of selves. While the world positively demanded the division of the self. It was a great comfort, thrill, intrigue, pleasure, logical solution for every Ursula to be queen of her own place and situation to know one's characteristics so indisputably and to inhabit it, a fine way to live. Even sorrow, if it was all you had to attend to, could be a pretty thing to turn and look at in different lights. When they realized the magic worked only one way, it was too late. The house was awfully small. Money was a problem. According to the government, which governed reality, only one Ursula had really been born, so only one Ursula could really work. The reasoning Ursula set ground rules. They could leave the house two at a time. Doubles didn't turn too many heads, but never more than two. For most errands, they sent the unassuming Ursula, who dispatched tasks quickly and efficiently and did not draw attention to the fact that she was shopping for a dozen. But only a few of the Ursulas actually liked hiding. Even the Ursula who loved to cook and clean got tired of cooking and cleaning for so many. And then there were the fights about horribly little things. Of course I should go, I'm the clever one, said Ursula. But you've got zero charisma, replied Ursula. And Ursula would come in waving her hands with concili conciliatory hope. How about me? They'll like me. I'll make them all feel comfortable and happy and somebody screamed. The scream of a final Ursula being born. The Ursula who needed to get out. That's it. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that reading. I'm sorry. I didn't know whether to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that reading. Um, yeah, I'll read a brief excerpt um, from one of my stories called Shifu. Um, yeah, it's it's very short. Uh, ooh, yes. Ooh, <laughs> some cover, some cover flaunting. I love it. My mother-in-law starts telling me this story about how she, how she didn't know she was pregnant. The night her son was born, she thought she was having gas. She was alone. But then my husband slipped out of her like a fish, and everyone said, "Kill it." That's when she left for the island. The baby dragged behind her in a net. I call her a liar. I won't forget the time she caught my husband washing a dish and called my own mother in Elan to complain how I wasn't doing my duty as a wife, how I made her son clean in his own home, how I threatened him with a back scratcher into rinsing that dish. 
And of course, my mother believed this and called to tell me I would never grow skin, as if, as if my husband has ever washed a dish, as if he's ever washed anything but his own dick, and even that not very well. The problem is this, I tell my daughter. Mothers grow up married to their sons, but we're born knowing our daughters will leave us, not because we want them to, but, be, but because we never really had them, not really. They belong to the men we give them to. Men, they belong to everything, including themselves. This is what I say. We should separate all mothers and sons at birth and grow them in different dirts. Make the sons grow up alone. And mothers, we'll be fine in our own rooms. Give us a window or two, a view, curtains that open into morning. All those times she almost killed herself, she didn't know death isn't like a man. It won't just take you any time you're on your back. When she finally dies, I won't pretend I'm not happy about it. But I'll buy her a good burial, a full funeral. I'll give her an urn with a name on it, which is more than her family would have done, her family who doesn't even name their daughters. That woman answers to nothing. I can't even pray her dead because the gods don't have her listed in any directory. When my husband dies, I'll bury him beneath her and I won't mourn then either. You can have his bones and the moths they'll become. I joke now with my daughter, not that it matters to her since the only men she'll marry are women and two women prop together probably cancel out, become nameless. I point at the sky, the sun I say and laugh. When choosing a son to see by, make sure it's got no mother. The moon, that's the mother. Her eye is always open to watch her son. It's not really a light, my, my daughter says about the moon. It's a mirror. But mirrors, I tell her, are more dangerous than anything. A mirror's only meaning is to multiply, to duplicate, to duty. The mirror doesn't change what is shown to it, not unless someone shatters the glass. And that would be you, my daughter the fist to my ribs, the one who will never become the moon. Thank you. Thank you, it's beautiful. Um, so I just wanna say, I'm so happy to be here with you both. And, you know, I love these collections for um, different, but also some of the same reasons. I felt like there were so many resonances between these two books and I'm so excited to talk about them with you. Um, you know, even in the titles, there's, um, of course there's, gods of want um in k ming's book but um mung when i read your book for the first time um i i was struck by how much desire and and want was sort of threaded through it and then you know in mung's book um well mung's book is called self-portrait with ghost product placement um and k ming's book also has has ghosts in it and so you know I kept getting the sense um that these stories were formed out of like a similar soup of ex existence and was kind of wondering um when did you write these stories maybe what was the general time frame and what were you thinking about during the writing of them what were some of the things that were on your mind Um, I guess I can go first. Um, so uh, I think I wrote the first story. Well, you know how stories are. Sometimes you start writing them like 10 years ago and then you put them away for five years and then look at them again. But I think I properly started writing these stories um, when I moved to San Francisco um, in 2017. Um, and this was the world after um, Trump was elected, which um, is our world now and is the soup of our um, muggy, <laughs> uh, muggy and um, uh, kind of apocalyptic lives <laughs> right now. Um, and um, I guess I was thinking a lot about, I was thinking about desire. Um, I was thinking about how um, I, about how my first book didn't have as much desire or pleasure um, or as much playfulness in it as I felt I had in my life. Um, and, and I was interested in um, sort of writing, 
yeah, writing that into the stories and into my characters. Um, and I was also thinking about like, one really big question that I was thinking about as, writing, as I was writing these stories is like, what is the point of art? <laughs> what is the point of storytelling? Um, there's a story in the collection called First Love and in the first paragraph, the um, narrator sort of wondering like, what is love good for? And I, I wonder all the time, what is art good for? What is storytelling good for? What is this thing that I've sort of dedicated my life to good for? Um, and, um, and especially at a time when it feels like, you know, the world's on fire and you should be just dropping everything to put that fire out. Um, so yeah, that's a sort of very general broad answer to the the mug of, of the air that I wrote these stories in. Yeah, I love the phrasing you use, the soup of existence. <laughs> I was like, it does feel very soupy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think for me, um, definitely a lot of oral stories um, in my family and in my neighborhood constantly kind of surround me and perforate all these other stories that I'm attempting to write. Um, and especially in Gods of Want, um, as the title kind of implies too, I think a lot of collective stories, um, co collectively told myths, um, urban legends, uh, yeah, forms of storytelling that feel communal um, and that are kind of told by many people and alive in their oral forms. I think really haunted me um, and I kept uh, writing into like the mysteriousness and the playfulness of those myths. I um, mean, even in that section that I read, um, I remember I'd heard a story um, from, from a friend of like, oh, you know, uh, I, I know about someone who got married and then uh, she asked her husband to do the dishes and the mother-in-law saw her asking that and called her mother behind her back and was like, how dare you have my son like do housework in his own home um, and told me about that. And I was like, oh my God, I need to write about that. <laughs> like level of surveillance, that kind of like um, uh, what it means to, to have that um, kind of like burden of domestic care and work um, solely on you. That dynamic was just so fascinating to me. And I feel like stories like that are always ripe for both tragedy and comedy. And I think, I, I was kind of surrounded by stories, by news, by um, rumors and hearsay that always contained an element of both something really comical and hilarious and something also really tragic um, or that had all of these kind of layers or shadows to it. Um, so I think holding the opposites and the extremes of those two things uh, really informed the stories. I'm wondering if um, putting together these collections taught you anything about your own writing or did you notice themes start to emerge? Did you um, notice resonances and then like lean into them or did you freak out and try to cut them out? Uh, what did putting the collections together teach you about, about yourself and your interests? Yeah, I think, hmm. I think that I actually learn by putting, like when you're working on stories, you don't, you can sort of pick one up and then put it down and pick another one up and put it down. Um, and putting the collection together, when I started to think of this book as a book and these stories as like belonging together, um, it actually helped me um, un like focus the stories in a way. Um, I, I don't know if I, I guess I had a feeling that they belonged together thematically or um, that I was like, that I was working out a certain type of sensibility um, and mode of writing um, and looking at similar things like the lives of women, like housework as well, caretaking um, and, um, and the ways in which like the world teaches you to be a woman. And, um, and it was kind of liberating because I had a story, if I had a certain story that perhaps like opened a door somewhere, but didn't walk through it, um, I could know that I could walk through it in another story. Um, and it helped me, um, it helped me with form and, um, 
boundaries and focus in um, in finishing the individual stories to like know that they were that they belong together. Yeah. Oh, I love so much what you were saying about like exploring the depth of these women's lives in domestic spaces. I don't know. I feel like that resonates with me so much because um, I feel like people often describe these sto the stories in my book as kind of balancing the magic and the mundane. And I find it really interesting that we considered, um, you know, the domestic world as mundane. Um, or these tasks as mundane when I see them as inherently mythical and fantastical um, and like in rep in repetition kind of becoming even more mythical and fantastical um, but yeah no for me I think in writing these stories I kind of learned to circle my obsessions and to allow um, these kind of linguistic quirks and um, obsessions to recur again and again and again and I actually found the structure of the book through the micro unit of language, because I realized I was using so many M words in the book. I had like a million mouths. Oh, million, there's another one. <laughs> I had like a million mouths, a million melons. There was like, a, there was a character named Melon who kept popping up. There were so many mothers and moons and myths. And I had like a, a list of probably 16 M words that I noticed and I was like, oh God, I'm using too many M words. But what I found is that if I allowed myself to lean into that level of obsessiveness in the language, that it actually helped me with broader things like structure and theme and figuring out how these stories are related to each other. And I ended up selecting three of those M words and organizing the whole book into a triptych and figuring out which story went into which M word section um, created the collection for me. Whereas before it was that like soup of existence <laughs> with no real form. So I feel like people often talk about in writing or in short stories that if you're obsessing over a single word, um, it's not really revising or that's not really work and that's not really editing. And I think coming from a poetry background, I'm like the language is the, <laughs> that is the work, the work of like finding one word in the story to me is, can have these like really macro repercussions um, for the story as a whole. And that's what I kind of learned through um, this, through these stories is that writing into the intimacy and the smallness um, and the language, I think allowed me to this, allowed me to see the entire thing kind of come into fruition. I love that. That feels related to, to like the housework and domesticity part, you know, just the repetition of like act and, and you finding the repetition in the words. Um, really quickly, Mung, I'm wondering if you could talk about um, how you organized your collection because it's also in sections. Right, there's like a triptych as well, but then there's but then there's the odd woman, which is a triptych in itself because <laughs> there's three odd women. Um, yeah, three is a really nice number. Um, but I, hmm, well, I thought that I would, I opened the collection with a story called Philip is Dead and um, a story called Suffering. And I saw those as sort of like, tonal and thematic um, almost like end posts um, that form a sort of like boundary for the scope of the collection and um, sort of introduce the reader to like okay like Philip is dead is kind of an intense story um, and, and so it's sort of like okay this is what you're gonna get um, and each of the triptychs ends with um, a fictional self-portrait um, I think that I think that I was in the fictional self-portraits. I'm I was interested in um, you know understanding fictionality and questioning fictionality, but also um, I guess trying to write a story that uh, revealed its mechanism. Um, which I, I tried to do in Suffering and some of the other stories as well. Um, I, yeah, I think once I came, once I settled on Self-Portrait with Ghost as the title for the collection itself, um, it, I, I came to sort of see that I, um, came in, you were talking earlier about like circling obsessions and one of the obsessions that I was circling in this phase of my writing is um, an obsession with dramas of the self, which is the form of Western literature, I guess. 
um, and um, and um, yeah, so I was interested in um, writing those dramas, but also question, like I, I wonder why, if, if that's the only way you can tell a compelling story. Um, and um, I was trying to sort of like drive into that um, while, while questioning it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I just want to say really quickly, because I, I love what you were saying about like kind of bringing the fictionality to the surface and like the meta-ness of that, because I, I, I feel like I saw that a lot in the title story as well, Self-Portrait with Ghosts, um, which I just love so much. But anyway, sorry, that was all. <laughs> That's my minor comment. Yeah, I mean, I think related to that, you know, I really wanted to talk about, um, I think in both of your books, there's just this feeling that um, reality kind of can't be trusted. You know, it's a little bit unsteady. There's a sense of like disorientation and um, you kind of wonder what we, ca we can even count on as true. Um, and in Self-Portrait with Ghost, I think um, the narrator imagines her dead aunt telling stories to fellow ghosts. And there's a line that's, um, they would accept her stories at face value without questioning which parts were real and which parts were fake, at least not in a narrow sense. Um, and it made me think, you know, so much other writing is that narrow sense, like that narrow sliver of reality. And I love that both of your work plays with um, just what's outside of that narrow slice, you know? And so I'm curious, about um, what you think of as the relationship between what's real and what's fake in fiction and what does real or fake even mean to you? Yeah, I love that question so much, especially because I love like didacticism. I don't know if that's the word <laughs> in fiction. And I love characters who are like very didactic in the way that they speak and are kind of asserting themselves in these ways that are um, like very certain or attempting to assert a reality, like from the story I read of like, of this mother who's very, um, very into like advice giving and um, kind of expressing experience as, as advice always. I love that so much. And I feel like we're typically taught to avoid that. <laughs> um, that we're typically taught to avoid like lesson giving or characters who um, are, saying things that might be kind of construed as didactic, but I, I really love like the layering um, of these different realities and what might be kind of coarse about them um, and uncertain about them and holding both um, like the certainty of the character with the uncertainty that that could reveal um, and what could be kind of interesting um, in those dynamics. Um, especially in roles where like, oh, one person is a caregiver, the other person is, is receiving. Um, like what, how, what kind of realities are they like imposing on each other and how do they contradict with each other? Um, yeah, and I, I think that I'm really interested, especially in um, thinking about like mytho-realism and mythical realism, um, because to me, mythology is so kind of like ground up. Um, it's rather than like top down, it's like, uh, it, I don't know, it comes from the collective um, and I feel like is, most alive when it's being doubted or questioned or retold or revised constantly. Like there's something about it that evades a stable truth or reality um, just by the nature of the kind of like sourcelessness of myth. Um, there's always like, oh, some say it's this, some say it's that, in certain language it's this, in different countries it's that. And um, I think there's something really beautiful and alive about that, that um, I, I enjoy being kind of grounded in that ungroundedness, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I love what you said. Um, unstable reality. I mean, that's real. Unstable reality is realism, it seems. Also, what is realism? I don't know. I love that you said that realism is something that's like formed by the collective and trickles down. I feel I like there's realism and then there's like realism in the sense of like, the literary tradition of realism, right? Um, and I guess some of the things that I'm working through um, as I'm as I was writing this book is this questioning of um, of of like what realism in Western literature actually means. Um, and I actually came. One thing that I've sort of been thinking about is that. Um, 
it feels to me very related to like the Cartesian sense of self in which, you know, I think therefore I am in which the only thing you can be sure of as real is the thinking, the cognitive self, basically. Um, and I'm like that sort of like the journey of that cognitive self um, against the world, the world as the backdrop feels to me like, like, um, I guess the like narrow realism that we have um, in the tradition of Western literature, which um, I think Kaming and I are sort of like writing maybe uncom uncomfortably, but um, happy in our discomfort or like coming to a place of being happy in our discomfort with. Um, so, I mean, that's something that I'm, I think about all the time is just um, how I can move away from writing that kind of realism. And for me in this book, um, part of the like drive, it felt, I think part of what I was trying to do is like get to the bottom of it to like, to tease out all the ways that um, I can use this type of realism. And hopefully I'll like break through some type of wall and come out on the other side where um, I can enter a realism that's like, given to us by the collective as Kaming described. Um, Kaming, you said, um, I think you enjoy being ungrounded. And that was the sense that I got from reading, I think both of both of your books. Um, there was just a pleasure in sort of surrendering to, you know, the confidence of your sentences and images. And um, there's a pleasure in it, even as there's also this sense that it's like the ground is unsteady, you know, and like anything could happen and things could surprise you. Um, and, and I think reading your stories is exciting for, for that reason, that surprise and, and um, yeah, that shakiness. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you could talk about the um, maybe process of writing this way. Do the stories come as a surprise to you too? Um, yeah, how do they how do they form? Yeah, I really enjoy the sensation of, of being disoriented in reading. And I find that I, I mostly read fiction and translation because I feel like I get to encounter structures um, and different ways of writing that do bring me to this place of almost like the euphoria of possibility <laughs> that so much is possible and there's something so incredible and I find myself constantly surprised. Um, yeah, and I definitely do think the keyword is surprise. I feel like for me, whenever I reach a moment of surprise, even if it's um, a piece of language or word or an image um, or realizing that this is not how I expect to end the story, um, I knew it was I knew it was something I wanted to continue to work on and that it was still alive for me. And so I tried to let myself be guided um, by that sense of, of delight and reaching that possibility. Um, and I, I've been saying it all throughout all of my events, but um, the poet Victoria Chang at the Bay Area Book Festival talked about how her philosophy in writing is language first, then ideas. Um, and I find that I write in the same process of language first, following the language um, and seeing where that leads me um, and, and not trying to start first with idea um, and this sense of that I know where the story is going or I know what the revelation will be or I know what will happen to this character. Um, I think there is a joy um, and, and, and pleasure, like you said, um, in following language um, and letting those pathways kind of reveal themselves. Um, I love that. I, I too feel pleasantly disoriented when I read your work, Kimmy. Um, and and always um, always like pleasurable delight. Um, I feel like writing. So usually, well, I don't know. Each story is different. Um, but usually, um, usually, what happens is that I hear. I don't write until I hear a sent a first sentence. Um, and then like feel a kind of like engine building behind that sentence. Um, and then I see where that engine takes me. And, um, and eventually if it's going to be a story that actually works, 
um, or that I'll actually keep working on. I'll at some point during following that engine, I'll feel a sense of shape um, and see and be able to sort of conceive of it as an object. Um, and sometimes there's a last sentence that I'm driving towards, but I don't know, but I don't know what's in the middle. Um, I felt also, you know, while reading both of your work that there's um, just this like very deep physicality in it. And, um, you know, Hmong in your sentences, I can really feel like the, like there's a body behind them and whether it's like the gallons of fluid feeling or like eating a peeled loquat. And then in K, K Ming's work, I feel like, I mean, there's just so much that's like kind of striking and like a little bit physically jarring, like um, there's a lot of eating things that you don't expect to be eaten. And um, and the fact about the 4.5 pounds of like American waste that's in inside every, inside the average American, I think will stay with me forever. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's just a lot that's um, that's really just like felt in the physical body and your work and, um, and it's so different, you know, from, from the kind of fiction that just sort of operates only in, in the brain and in thought. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about the relationship between writing and the body for you. Oh, oh sorry, I, I don't know, should I go first? Okay, it's so funny that you mentioned a relationship between the writing and, and the body because um, I remember when I was writing these stories, um, I was eating dinner with my mom and she, she asked me, she was like, so I want to know, like she, she like leaned in and it was very philosophical. And she was like, I want to know what is writing to you? Like, is it, is it like pooping? Is it like something you have to do like pooping or is it your art? <laughs> and I thought, I thought that was so wonderful and delightful. And I was like, I guess it kind of is like pooping and that I'm like metabolizing things in my life and in my world. And I guess all metaphor is like kind of turning something into something else. And pooping is also like transforming matter into this other matter. And I was like, you know what, I'm into it. <laughs> I really like this idea that there's something about writing that like isn't this my mysterious higher up mental thing, but it's actually this like metabolism and digestion. Um, Cause I feel that way in a, uh, a lot where I, I feel like my writing is sometimes is like the byproduct and waste products of my life <laughs> where I'm like, oh, that crow on, on my way to work. I love how that crow is like playing in the street and it has nothing to do with my work. It has nothing to do with like my social life, nothing. It is kind of this like waste, wasteful experience or like nothing. It doesn't really fit into anything like practical or productive or routine, but it ends up later in the writing because I just remember that crow <laughs> playing on the side of the road. Um, so I was like, yeah, I guess it is like pooping. I guess that's gonna be my new philosophy. If people ask me what my writing means to me, <laughs> um, I, I love that she gave that as an option. But yeah, I just, I think that there's something both like really sacred and profane about the body. And I love getting to play with like the grotesqueness um, and sometimes horror that we feel towards bodies, be it our own or other people's bodies, and also the sense of wonder and like miracle at the same time. And yeah, again, with that sense of like contrast or opposites that I feel like the body encompasses so much of. Um, so I love writing into that space of like, oh, repulsion and attraction existing in the same moment or horror and wonder, fascination and disgust um, kind of all in the same um, yeah, all in the same realm. Cause I find that like my bodily reaction to seeing something that's really wondrous and seeing something that is really horrific are the same physical sensation and same feeling. And I was like, oh, my body is like kind of smarter than my brain <laughs> in that it knows like, it knows that it, there's this thing that contains so much um, on a spectrum of feelings and reactions. Um, and my brain is like trying to box in like, oh, what's wonderful, what's terrible, what's horrible. Uh, but my body is like experiencing it all as one. And so um, I, I want to write that way and um, kind of bring that sense of all encompassing um, -ness, <laughs> another word I made up uh, to the characters on the page. I don't think I have a better answer than my writing is pooping. <laughs> That's pretty great. Um, yeah, because it's kind of like 
painful but slightly pleasurable to maybe that's too much information um but uh body yeah so um there's a line in three women i think the character said the narrator says something like she was in um, about the time that she was in college that she was interested i was interested in my mind um and did not wonder about my did not wonder about my body and um yeah like I think I started writing as um I entered into the humanities through philosophy so I started writing interested um in ideas and um I've always been an a very abstract sort of thinker um and um uh, more and more I'm feeling like my the like intrinsic abstractness of the way that I think maybe comes from the Chinese language. Um, but um, as I um, as I learn to write or um, come into my um, come into myself as a writer, the only way that it was possible for me to do that was to um, was to go deeper and deeper into the body. Um, a sentence doesn't really feel like real, we were talking about realism earlier, right? It's, a sentence doesn't feel real to me unless it has, unless it has um, a sort of like heft or a like solidity, a concreteness. Um, and so maybe I started writing um, in a way that grounded the body as a corrective to my instincts. Um, but now more and more, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to forget everything that my brain knows, everything that my mind thinks it knows, um, and, um, and to, and to listen to the, what is often called the lizard brain, pejoratively, but, um, but I think maybe it's like the best part of us, um, which is what, um, our bodies intuit and um, know without having to form into language or, or thought or idea. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anywhere else we can go except writing is like pooping. <laughs> That's so amazing. Mung, when you were talking about sentences having heft, I was just thinking about, about poop. Um, I, I wanna remind everybody um, to ask questions in the Q&A little, thing, chat box thing. And um, I'll maybe ask one more question and then we can move on to, to audience questions. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to end with, um, you know, in both of these collections, um, I, I just had this sense that um, I was so excited to, to read each story. It felt like um, there was such a range in each of your collections and they sort of um, and it was really just exciting to like sort of see what the short story could do, you know, and Kaming, you have a story that's called Episodes of Hoarders that's just, it, there's no punctuation, it's almost like a poem, um, and Mung, you know, your stories range so much from like self-portrait with ghosts, which is just a few pages long, to The Odd Women, um, which is like a superhero story, kind of, um, and so I was just wondering, I mean, I think this is related to Mung's question like existential question of what is art for, but um, what is a short, short story for? <laughs> Why do this? I know we have to do it because it's like pooping um, and you have to get it out, <laughs> but what else is it, is it for? Uh, what is the short story for? Well, it's for things that aren't big enough for novels. <laughs> Maybe it's like small poops. Um, <laughs> I'm um, sorry about this. Um, everyone's just gonna leave this event and go to the bathroom and have a great time and feel like they're a, 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 an artist. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of, I mean, novels can 
contain so much and they can be so messy. On the one hand, I think that like stories um, are this place that you can like sort of control everything and make everything perfect and make it like, I can hold the entire object of my story in my mind abstractly and I can like sort of see it and like walk around it in my mind. I can't do that with a novel project yet. Um, I haven't, I've only successfully written one so far, so I, maybe in the future I'll be able to, but yeah, so on the one hand, it feels like this thing that you can almost make perfect um, and see and hold in its entirety, but on the other hand, like, because it's smaller, there's so much freedom and playfulness and um, experimentation that can go into them, um, so I think, like, part of what I wanted to do in my collection or the way that I wrote was um was just like I didn't feel bound by one style or one sensibility um, because I knew that you know in the next story I could show that that was that was just a certain mode right like that was like the slow song in the album and the next one's like the dance party um yeah yeah, I think for me, because I'm so obsessed with myth and folklore and histories, I find that those forms are often in the form of short story or flash, a creation story, a destruction story, um, a myth are often like in these condensed forms and kind of exist like neighbors <laughs> um, in their own world. And so for me, there's something really elemental about the short story. I just think that we're so surrounded by it, like even just telling anecdotes to our friends or phone conversations, like this short form of storytelling that allows for, you know, exposition and experimentation and um, not a kind of complete arc um, exists everywhere in our lives. And so, um, yeah, to me, it felt like there was also so much potential for like a chorus of voices or a chorus of lives to exist, especially in a collection. Um, yeah, that there was something about, like it could be a community um, of stories or a neighborhood or, um, I don't know, encompass uh, this range in a way that um, I think maybe novels are less like kind of structurally um, built to do. Um, so, it was really, it was really fun to think about like, oh, what, how much more can I hold um, in these stories? Yeah. So we have a few questions. Um, a question from Mai is, I'd love to hear you both talk about going from novel writing to story writing. Was a reorient reorientation necessary? Do you feel like you were writing the same way in each form? For K Ming, is language first also in how your debut was written for Hmong following the lizard brain? Hmm. I feel like I talked about that a little already. I think well, the main difference, I mean, I just felt a lot more free in these stories because with my first novel, I just, I felt like I had to put, I wasn't sure if I would publish another book, you know, like, I didn't know if it would be published, you know, before I wrote it. Um, so it felt like my only chance to make something. And so it's like, well, better put everything I've ever <laughs> experienced in it, um, everything I've ever felt and thought and, you know, learned. Um, and, um, and so it's sort of like this, uh, this like question of how do I make all these unwieldy things into something that's elegant um, and not um, just the disaster that is everything I've ever thought. Um, so yeah, it was a lot more freeing and, um, and, and fun. Yeah, I think for me, it, no matter what genre or what scope I'm writing in, um, whether it's, it's a novel or a short story, a poem, it is language first, then ideas, which is why I go so awry. <laughs> so awry in my first draft because I'm just like this sounds great <laughs> and then later on my editor will be like what does it mean and I'm like I don't know I just like how it sounds <laughs> I like to say it out loud um and I'm like oh the language is its own meaning um its own kind of uh I really love language of excess and language of surplus and um it feels very also part of like a queer lineage of writing to write in a way that feels like excess or excessive or surplus and um so I find myself writing into that and 
I think in some ways it's almost even more so than language first. It's like metaphor first. Um, and I often find the beginning of what I want to write no matter what, and that I, there's usually some image that I want to make literal um, or a metaphor that I want to push to its farthest point and see where it takes me. Like, oh, that person has feline eyes. What if they are a cat? <laughs> like, what if they're half cat, half human? Um, so for me, there's I try to approach the page with a sense of playfulness and possibility. Um, yeah, rather than thinking first about like, oh, what I logically want to do just because I find it the most fun for me, I think, as a writer. And it brings me back to a kind of like poetic practice too of, of really getting to play with the language. Okay, we have one from an anonymous attendee. Um, is there any topic that you would like to explore but hesitate to because of fear or trepidation of where it may take you? And it's interesting that this anonymous person is fearful of being known. I think fear is good. I think when you're afraid of something that you're writing, um, maybe you're writing something that's interesting. Um, I have the sort of lucky, unlucky um, situation of um, my family members not really um, interested in or able to read in English. So the greatest fear that I have is um, allayed by that um yeah but but yeah I think fear is I I try to follow my fear in my writing yeah I agree with that I think fear is really great and, and doubt and uncertainty um is really great and I, I feel like some people should be more fearful of what they're writing I think we live in a world where some people should have more fear and more shame um about what they're writing or narratives that they yeah anyway that's another thing but yeah I think for me if there's anything that I'm most fearful of in some ways this is maybe like a broader fear but I do fear that by following my obsessions I am in some way like limiting myself or being repetitive or being um yeah or not saying anything that's interesting or new and I do have this fear of writing the same story over and over again um, probably enforced by my uh, attempts to write uh, in third person and being really bad at it. <laughs> um, I don't, maybe that comes from poetry too. But uh, yeah, so I think I just um, am scared to do the thing that actually produces my writing, which is to write about what I'm obsessed about. So I think I have to like constantly give myself permission and realize that if that is what's generating the writing and that's where it's coming from, I shouldn't try to like stamp it out at the source um, and feel like it's not important or interesting. Um, this might be related to something Hmong mentioned. Um, anonymous attendee, could be a different one, asks, I am writing, I'm wondering if you ever tried writing in a different language or how do you feel about writing in a different language? Kaming, you mentioned reading a lot of works in translation. Yeah, I actually, I have a story in the book called Mandarin Speakers that's about language really explicitly. And um, I'm always really interested in languages that we inherit. Um, uh, and that language can be kind of anything, whether it's like idioms or ways of thinking about the body or like gendered language. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in like kind of also the languages within languages um, and kind of write really explicitly toward that. Um, but yeah, I think I the a process of translation is always kind of there in my writing, um, whether it's kind of like, you know, idioms that have been translated multiple ways, like back and forth um, across time and between characters. Um, yeah, or kind of like thinking about the language of adolescence. I think that is in itself its own translation, um, like thinking about um, how a child would see something or view something to me is also uh, a process of translation um, and another way to kind of shift language. Um, yeah, so I'm always, that part of my mind is always um, working, I think, when I'm writing. I'd love to write in a different language, but unfortunately I'm not good at enough at any of them. 
Um, I have dabbled into translation, which um, I think Kaming has as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, like Kaming said, I like writing itself feels to me like the process of translation. You're translating from consciousness or from the body, from you know being alive into language, um, which is not um, it's not a direct translation ever. Um, yeah, I, I'd be thrilled if I could write in a different language, but I don't know. It takes a lot of time to learn how to write in one language. So I don't know. Um, well, I think that's all the time we have um, for tonight. Alexa has some closing remarks from Powell's. I do, thanks, Rachel. Um, thank you to all of you for that uh, conversation. It's just my mind was going in so many directions and I think it's rare to have a, a conversation that moves from the mythic to the scatological that seamlessly. <laughs> it was really enjoyable. Um, and yeah, just talking about the apocalyptic soup of our lives, which is a great phrase. I think uh, it's gonna stick with me for a while. So thank you so much, all three of you for joining us today um, and speaking with us about your, your wonderful books. Um, again, this is uh, Meng Jin, Kei Ming Chang and Rachel Kong. Um, and all of their books are available at powells.com. Um, I wonder if there's a way to hold them up all together because just the cover art on these is incredible. And I feel like they all deserve to be shown together. Not doing a very good job at this, but you get the idea. Um, I've left some links in the chat for you to make that easy um, to support our authors and to support Powell's. Um, that's all I have to say, I think, other than please, uh, you know, check out our upcoming virtual events at powells.com. And uh, once again, thank you to Meng Jin, Kei Ming Cheng, Rachel Kong, and to all of you for joining us. Uh, we we'll hope to see you again uh, on our virtual event. Uh, cycle as it continues. So uh, have a great day, everyone, and take care until then.